We're concluding our series, actually, we're no, next to concluding our series on, I'm really doing well this morning. Excuse me, everybody. Boy, oh boy, I, I'm sharp this morning. Anyhow, we are uh, concluding the basic part of our series this week. Next week, we'll be talking about generational blessings, how to break generational curses and begin to put blessings on your children, your grandchildren, and what comes after you. And it's going to be an exciting time as we celebrate what God has done. But basically, this whole series has been free. Uh, discovering the divine you. And remember, every person is made in the image of God. You hear me say that all the time because we have this notion that there's certain people that God likes and other people God doesn't care about. And that's not true at all. The fact that you and I are alive today tells me and t- should tell you that you have a purpose and a plan that God has for every person. Our desire is to help us to know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. That's what we're all called about, and that's freedom. When you begin to realize the reason why you're alive is not just to exist, but to make a difference, to be on a winning team of heaven, to make a difference in the world. When you have a passion to live, it keeps you on course, and it's easier to live the right life. But if you don't have a passion, you don't have a reason for living, it's really easy to veer off. So I really want to encourage you today about that. And today at 1230, right on the conference room on the right-hand side here, we have something called Discovery um, 301. I want to encourage you to come to that. And we have a few extra spots. We're going to have a class. We're going to help you discover your gifts and how you can fit into the church here and how we can work together. That'll be happening today. So let's get back to our series in more detail now. We've been talking about becoming free in Christ, discovering the reason why we are alive. And God has us to become free. I want to go back to our hallmark verse through this whole thing. We've been launching from this verse virtually every week. We're going to read it again. It's found in John 8, verse 31. And this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide, if you live in my world, you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know, you shall know, gnosko, you shall know, you shall be very well acquainted with knowledge. Not just understanding to reciting it, but you shall know it by doing. You shall know the truth, And the truth will make you free. The truth is a person. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He is the life. If truth sets us free, guess what holds us in bondage? Lies. The father of all lies is the enemy. There is a real enemy out there that would try to bound us and bind us from achieving, stop achieving what God would have for us. You should know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they said they answered we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. They're the church of his day. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And that's the problem. There's no way you and I can get free if we don't think we're bound. If you think you're perfect, how many people know people like that? They're perfect. There's a political candidate out there that makes no mistakes. I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going to mention about his hair or nothing. At least he has it. I'm not talking about it. What are you laughing about? That's shameful. Okay. I have no opinions about, I'm going to keep out of politics, okay? I'm sorry, I'm just having too much fun. But it always makes you laugh when people don't admit they're wrong. And, you know, one of the things that shows, you know, we, we all are not perfect. All of us make mistakes. And, um, and so the Bible says here, they say, we're Abraham's descendants. I've never been in bondage to anybody. And so if you don't think you've got issues, you can't get free of your issues. The, whole, the most hopeless person in the world is a person that thinks they have it all together. Listen, one of the greatest things that you and I can do is realize that we're not perfect and that we have errors of our life that need to change. Not because God's going to love us any less. God loves us. He wants to find us, have us to find freedom and joy and the reason why we're alive. And so they said, how can you say we're in bondage? How can you say we be made free? We're not in bondage. And many of the church don't realize that they're in bondage. And what does the Bible say? He said this, Jesus said. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So if you and I are still sinning, then you are a slave to certain degrees. All of us have slavery on us, and we have to constantly get free. It's my purpose and my joy to say, God, I want to overcome an obstacle and move on to our next one. But we all have stuff that lingers on, that's like an Achilles heel, that's something that keeps on coming around. How many of us have been around the mountain? I thought I dealt with this issue already. Comes back again. Well, God wants us to, to achieve freedom from all sorts of situations, freedom from addictions, freedom from all kinds of issues in our life that we could walk in the path that has for us. And, uh, and Jesus said, uh, most surely I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. We also mentioned the fact now, we don't believe in a Christian can be demon-possessed, 
that a demon has complete control over you. It was a poor translation of the King James. They took the Greek word and they put the word English word for possess, which gives a connotation that the demons have complete control. That's not true. The actual word is demonize. And what it basically means is be infested or influenced by demonic forces. Make no mistake, there are demons out there. They're not the little cute ones you see on post. I don't know if there's any cute ones, but they're not the little demons with pitchforks. I mean, they're real fallen angels out there, and they're out there to try to trap us up. But the Bible says, I've given you victory over them, and so what we want to do is get that stuff out of us. You can be demonized. What I mean by that is, the Bible says in Ephesians, be angry, but do not sin. Uh, just uh, not too long ago, I, I went through a series of circumstances that were stressful, and I held myself really, really well. I did very well through the stress. But afterwards, I, I noticed that I, I was getting angry and snapping and getting angry at the children, getting angry at everything. And I'm like, what's my deal? I felt like there was something on me. So I literally, I said, I felt like there was a spirit of anger on me. So I told my wife, Sandra, honey, you need to pray for me. I don't know what's going on with me, but I had, I think it's a resident, I think it's all the frustration I've been going through. I'm kind of beginning to the lash out. I, there's something not right here. I, I sense there's a spirit. So we prayed and it left me and I'm fine. So stop it! No. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I guess stuff happens. I got offended. I, I'm not offended, but I went through a lot of stress. And some circumstance with the family and things like that. Not our family here, but, uh, but things like that. And I, I didn't realize it, but it started affecting me afterwards. After the whole thing was solved, there was issues. And I realized that it got on me. And so I opened the door. So I had to close the door. And guess what I did? I closed the door. It left me. The enemy came in, because I had a little way, oh, cool, I'm going to push some buttons on you now. I'm like, why am I responding this way in the name of Jesus? My wife and I took authority over it, and, and I'm, I'm better now. So I'm not going to throw anything at you today, so I should be very happy. But I'm just telling you, it, it's always freedom, freedom, freedom. Every day I want to get more free. I could share stories with you of how I got free. And uh, this wasn't in my notes, but I need to set, I don't know why, but I need to share this story again. It wasn't in my notes. And so um, I'm going to veer off my topic a little bit. I'm going to share with you how bondage can get on you, how generational bondages can get on you. There was a period of time that uh, I, I, was, I grew up German and Italian. And to make a long story short, and my German heritage, they often, if you've noticed, I can say because I'm German, Germans often think they're better than other people. They just do. I mean, I, generally speaking, okay, if you're German, get over it. I'm German too, okay? So we often think we're better than other people. And then also, we also had the slave trade in America, where we used to treat African Americans as subservient. We used to think they were lower than, than people. That's the truth. It was in our culture. It got in our DNA. Make no mistake about it. So I grew up thinking, I, I, if you said you're a racist, oh no, I have, I have, I have um, African American friends. I have Latino friends. I'm fine with it. I'm good with it. But sometimes it'd be a joke, and I'd say it and laugh about it, and we'd talk about all oh, those people over there. We'd say all kinds of things. I was completely blind that I had an issue. Well, I was in graduate school starting, to go, starting the ministry in seminary, and I was, uh, I was um, working uh, at fundraising, imagine that, and I was watching a TV program as TBN was on, and there was this African-American singer that was really um, flamboyant and really going to town, and my friend and I kind of laughed and kind of, kind of mocked her. And like, look at that. And some woman next to me said, who do you think you are? And she put me, she put me in my place. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than they are? I said, oh, stop it. I said, you know, people need to laugh at themselves. I tell German jokes, Italian jokes, get over yourself. He says, no, you're an elitist, and you think you're better than other races. I'm like, oh, stop it. Come on. Will you knock it off? So I was like, oh, whatever. I go home that night to, to the condo I was staying at, and I was angry. I was like, man, what's wrong with that? Why do people need to relax and joke around? We're too uptight in this country, and I start getting angry. And I'm like, why am I so angry? It's like something hit me. And, I, and then what I often learned, if I get angry or get upset, I ask the Lord, Lord, why am I feeling this way? By the way, it's a good way. Instead of attacking someone else, ask the Lord, Lord, why am I feeling this way? Why am I agitated with this woman? I'm overreacting. Just like the other day when I was overreacting to little things, I realized it was a spirit of anger. I dealt with it. I, I knew enough to say there's something on me. So all of a sudden, I began to pray, and the Lord showed me. He says, you are an elitist, and you think you're better than other races. You think you're better. You say you're not a racist, but you are an elitist. You think that you're higher, you have more value than other races. And the Lord touched me. You know what happened to me? I wept. I don't, we don't cry. I cry over Hallmark commercials and my kids. That's basically it. Or when the Yankees lose. But anyhow, I began to weep. 
I began to travail to the point that I had my eyes were all swollen, and I said, God, please forgive me. God gave me a godly sorrow. It was not a sorrow that I had. I was like crying for my generation. I was crying for my family line. And I said, God, forgive me. And I, I just poured it out before him. I kid you not. And I prayed, and I prayed. I said, God, forgive me. I'm so sorry. The next morning, I went to bed. I was angry. I was gone. Next morning, I went to, the, to Regent University. I went to the, the, to the square, and there's uh, Indians, African Americans, you know, all these different nations there. Wonderful. And I was, it was like, how many of you ever had uh, got glasses for the first time? Before you didn't realize, you put them out. Wow, those are leaves. It's like God put, yeah. Isn't that just green stuff? I mean, they actually had little. I put gla- I, like the Lord opened my eyes, and I saw races for the first time as equals, and not myself better. That's significant. Now I'm going to say something that's going to offend you. I've been doing it for the last two weeks. Might as well continue on. Okay. You have to understand, I know this is going to be controversial. I'm saying something here that's a bit like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Well, I need to say it because it's, it, it shows how deep this went. I was, e- and I married my wife, I was even attracted to an African-American woman, young woman. That would have never happened in the past. I said, well, they still need to stay with their own. We stay with our own. That. Okay, I'm just, the, the, not that I knew the Lord, I almost want, you know, the Lord did a work in my heart. Pastor, how can you say that? I'm telling you the amount of deception that was on me. I was in bondage to a spirit of elitism which would disconnect me from the availability of receiving more of the body of Christ and more blessing that I was completely keeping them off. Well, those people, now there are people together. Now, this wasn't under my notes. I'm saying it for someone here today. I don't know who you are or someone watching, but if you got issues like that with different races, you got a problem. Because God loves every single race. And I'm convinced if the Lord didn't do that work in me, this would be a church that would be all predominantly white, boring, and German. Okay? Maybe a little Italian. But because the Lord healed me of that, I ended up marrying a Latino woman from Colombia. Now, if I offended you by saying what I said, I'm sorry. But I, 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 you know, listen, I can come up here and talk about junk, or I can be real with you. If you want someone phony, go to another church. I, and here, I'd rather be real with you guys. I'll tell you the journey I've been on, okay? And uh, you know what? And we need to fight against this racism and elitism. It's not of God. And some of us have a social economic type of, ra- well, those people, you know, we're the rich. And listen, we got to knock that junk off. And we got to be the people of reconciliation. It was not on my notes, but I had to bring it up. That was a bondage that God set me free of. And if, I'm, if anyone watching online, I'm sorry. And if I'm offending any of my family, I know you guys don't have that problem, but it did run in our genes, I'm sorry to say. And I just got to deal with it. Let's be honest here. So back to our regularly scheduled program. Actually, there is a lot to do with what we're talking about. That's an example of me becoming freer. Listen. All of us have areas. Let me, let me encourage you with something else. When something irritates you, it's an opportunity for you to grow. The fact that it's irritating me, it means it's coming against you. You gotta ask yourself the question, why is this irritating me? Why is this bothering me? And you might have righteous reasons to be irritated, but if you get, let me tell you something. God has healed me so much by irritating me, allowing me to be irritated. I'm serious. The reason I'm the pastor I am because I got irritated with the church the way it used to be. I got tired of big, big, big chairs on the stage with people sitting up there like they're better than everyone else. I got tired of pastors being fake. I'm not saying, I, I'm just telling you how I grew up. I'm like, you know what, if I'm gonna be a pastor, I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna be real with the people. I'm gonna be on their level because I'm not better than anyone else and we're gonna help everyone realize they have value. And so that was irritating. That irritation brought me freedom and brings the church more freedom. So when you're irritated, ask the Lord what's going on. It could be the Lord wants to set you free of something, okay? Now back to what we're talking about. Back to my notes. All right. Uh, What's my passcode again? Uh, Okay. There we go. All right. And if I offended you, I'm sorry. Talk to me afterwards, okay? Uh, Is that all right, everybody? I know I said something. I was like, whoa, I can't believe you said that. Yeah, I did say it. Okay. You know why? Because the enemy says a lot of junk, and we need to get rid of it. All right. So the Bible says, Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And the slave, does, verse 35, does not abide in the house forever, 
but a son abides forever. So many of us are, are not experiencing the freedom that God would have for us in our lives. Instead of being a son and, and enjoying what God has for us, we're limiting. Well, I'm not good enough for God, or I'm not ex experiencing what God has for us. God has free, freedom for us. The Bible says, therefore, there's 36, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. My friends, that's good news. If the son sets you free, you shall be what? Free. free indeed. What is that supposed to mean? That means that your sin does not define you. Your Savior does define you. That means your sickness does not define you. Your Savior defines you. And no matter what you go through, no matter what social economic background you had, no matter what your past, no matter if you've been on three, four marriages, I don't care what you've been through, your past does not define you. Jesus defines you. And if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. No more of this, well, you got to pay up. No, Jesus paid up, so we don't have to pay up. we got to give up to go up. Okay, and this is all part of it. If the sun sets you free, you should be free indeed. And you cannot be free if you don't think you're in bondage. My friends, if you're alive today, all of us have bondage in our life. Seriously, we all do. And we talk about different doors, okay? Different doors. Now, I'm going to bring up a scripture verse that you may not want to put on your refrigerator, but it's kind of like, oh, great, this is not a very positive verse. I know I've been touching a lot of areas lately that are controversial, and here we go again. Why not? Luke chapter 11, verse 24. Jesus is talking about someone that gets set free and the responsibility the person has to deal with it. Okay, here we go. Verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, or a woman in this case, he goes to dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes in and takes in him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. How many have known people that gave their lives to Christ and they've turned away and they're worse off than they ever were before? Yes. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that when you get yourself clean, you better fill that house with something else and you better get locks on your doors and you better protect yourself because the enemy does not like that you have freedom. But the good news is this, greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. Remember, we said that the devil's a terrorist, okay? He's not stronger than God. He comes in by lies. So we need to arm ourselves. We'll talk about that today, how we need to arm ourselves and not let those spirits come back. Are you telling me I'm be demon-possessed? No, but you can be demon-influenced, Come on, have you never been in a place where you walk in, it's like, man, there's like a spirit here. Have you never been in an argument with somebody or a situation, and it's like something beyond you is on you? Absolutely. We're dealing with, not dealing with flesh and blood, but spiritual principalities of high places, the Bible says. And so this is all part of it. So this can be a bummer. Oh, God, what do you have to do that for? Why do we have to sweep it clean? You need to be worse off? Yes, you need to keep yourself clean. How do you do that? By the power of the grace of the Lord. You see, there's a cycle that takes place, and the cycle is, I don't know if you've noticed it, it happens with governments, countries, churches, where what happens, they get freedom. You find freedom, you do well for a while, and then, oh, okay, I'm doing good, and then you get kind of, uh, you get complacent. Have you noticed that? You know, you have freedom. How about our country, for example? I don't know if you realize this, but our country, we, we separated from the British. We got free, and we started doing great innovation. We got through World War I, and in World War II, we're doing great. We're prosperity, and all that kind of begins to happen. And all of a sudden, we start getting, we, our freedom turns to be a curse instead of a blessing. We forgot where the blessing comes from. And we're today, for example, that... Uh, uh, only, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but the taxes that the government collects only pays for 60% of the government's bills. That means that 40% is not secured by taxes. That means we're borrowing 40% of our income to run our country. Imagine if you ran your home like that. That's bondage. Okay? And so, I, and I know I'm mentioning things that are negative about that, but that's true. That's an example of bondage. Here's a cycle. You find freedom. You give your life to Christ. You're doing well. Hey, we're doing good. Well, it's okay. I'll just do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And the next thing you know, you find yourself in bondage to that. And it's a cycle. That's what it is. It's a cycle that begins to happen. Well, how do we get free of it? 
How do we get free of that cycle? I, I encourage you today. This is a pattern you'll see throughout history. It's really, 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 really uh, obvious in the book of Judges, which really does a phenomenal job of showing this cycle pattern. They get blessed by God. They take it for granted. And then they fall into sin. They get caught up. And then what happens? They repent. They ask God to forgive them. God raises to deliver. They get back again. They, they do well for a while. They get freedom again. All of us have a little brave heart with a blue face inside of us. We want freedom, right? We like freedom, and God has created us for freedom. He's created us to be creative. He's created us to, be, um, to take things and to do things and discover things. That's how he made us. And so how do we stay free? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a book of the Bible called Galatians, which we'll get into later on, uh, probably in the new year here, or in the same year later on. Galatians 5.1 says the following. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of which Christ has made us free. Stand fast. In other words, stand in it. Stay in it. Hold fast. Stand fast means guard. You know, don't, it doesn't mean the whole verbiage there and the whole grammar is not, it's not a passive. It is a, a very intentional stand guard. Do not mess around. Make sure you stand fast. Don't let your freedom ebb away. That's so easy to happen. Therefore, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke, a yoke is a, like a bondage upon you. Stand free, don't let it. Don't let that sin which so easily entangles us stand firm, continue to fight the fight. How do you stop the cycle? You don't have to, and I remember sometimes I'm gonna be, uh, uh, remember when I was a teenager going to a, a retreat like our children or our teenagers going to Manadnock and I'd come back and I'd, I'd cry and I'd go to the front, oh Lord, I'm so sorry, and I'd sing songs and sing We Are the World and do all that kind of stuff and smile. And then i go back on Monday and by, four, and by Wednesday, I'm worse off than I was before I went to the retreat. And I got to the point, I get so tired of repenting, sorry God, go, so you know what, I, I'll keep God a little distance. I believe in God, I love God, but let's not get too close because I get too close, I'll be too disappointed. And so many of us live our lives that way. That's not the life that God would have for you. You see, freedom is both in a moment and in a lifetime. God gives us freedom. He buys the house. In other words, if, imagine if I could buy your home. I bought you a $650,000 home. I gave it to you. I wish I could do that. And I gave you the home. Now, what do you got to do now? You got to do what? Take care of the house, right? Work on the house. And so God paid for our freedom, but we still have to maintain that freedom it's through discipline. Yes, there is discipline in this scripture. There is discipline in becoming more like Christ. You don't work for your salvation, but you work for the benefits that God has for you. The Bible says work out your salvation, not work in. Work in what God, work out what God has worked in. Does that make sense? Okay, you hope you understand that, all right? So that's all part of it. So it's a life journey. So freedom happens in layers. And so I want to show you something I heard from a preacher a number of years ago. I can't remember who it was, so I can't give credit. But uh, I'm going to try because I don't remember who the person is. I heard a number of years ago a story about the prodigal son, which does a great job of illustrating this freedom process. I'm going to share some things perhaps you've not heard before in this story that Jesus gave as a parable to illustrate a point. It's found in Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. So to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Let me just stop there. For a young man to tell his father that in that culture was basically saying, Dad, I want you dead so I can have your stuff. It, it, not even waiting for the person to die so you can fight with your brothers and sisters. Said, I want it now. I want my inheritance now, God, I, God or Dad. I want it now. And in that culture, if anyone heard that story, they'd be like, oh my gosh, how could someone, that's, that's, that's scandalous for what that child did to show dishonor to his father saying, I want my inheritance now. Dad, I want you dead so I can have your stuff. And that's really an insulting. And what does the father do? The younger son told the father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. I want you to hold on to that. We'll go back to that. He divided his wealth among his two sons in the story. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. 
About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. So those are happening. He basically insulted his father, did something terrible, totally insulted his father, totally disrespected him, took all the money, went out, had freedom. I got freedom. I got, a, I got paid. It's Friday. <laughs> and he, paid all, he basically spent all of his money, and he was with prostitutes and wild living. And know what he does next? Well, look what happens next. He actually comes and works on a farm. Verse, um, verse 15 so how's the first way you get help? How do you find freedom? This is a really profound one. It, number one, admit you need help. The first step to freedom is to admit you need help, that you have a problem. Admit it. Admit you need to help. Look what happens here in verse 15. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him to the fields to feed pigs, which were unclean animals. Jew good Jewish people would not touch pigs. The young man became so hungry, even the pods he was feeding on, the pigs, pigs look, he's looking at pig slops. That looks really good. The guy was really hungry. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, how many of us need to come to our senses? How long are you going to say, I'm going to stop clicking that site. I'm going to stop smoking or drinking. I'm going to stop uh, with this situation. I'm going to stop this, uh, this relationship that I'm having with all these people online. I'm going to stop flirting. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop whatever your issue is. I'm going to stop window shopping everywhere I go. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, look at that. I'm going to stop. Come to my sense, what am I doing? This has got to stop. This cannot continue. So he came to his senses. He said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. See, he recognized that he was in need. My friends, that's a good place to be. When you recognize you're in need, praise God. It's a time to thank God. Thank you, God, that I have enough unction and wisdom to know that I'm a mess. That's an opportunity. What? Yeah. You should be happy when you realize you've got a problem. Really? Yeah. Why? Because it's an opportunity to get better. You see, the enemy would say, yeah, you got a problem. You're a jerk. You're going to stay down. What kind of Christian are you? You're no good. You're no good, baby. You're no good. <laughs> a little Motown going on here, okay? And uh, Motown, no town. But anyhow, you, you feel like you're down, you're out. You know what God would say? What are you doing? You're better than this. I love you. I got a plan for you. Come on, get up. Get up. I believe in you. Come on, knock it off. I believe in you. That's the Holy Spirit saying, come back. Anytime you hear the, the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. So if you hear, you're no good, you can never do it, you have to sit in the back of the church, you can never, if anyone ever knew the stuff you did, if they knew the kind of attractions you had and do what you did, you'd be, you'd be done. And God would say, no, I have something better for you. Come on, let it go. I love you. There's a better way out. You're not stuck in this thing. Okay, and that is admit you need help. There's nothing you can do for anybody until you need you need help. And I've seen drug addicts and things of that nature, and I, I've I've come to know well enough now. If someone comes and need help. You're not ready yet. What do you mean? You're not desperate. You give me excuses. Well, I, once I get, I got to get my job. Listen, if you really want help, you have to admit there's no more rights. You've blown it, and you're gonna do whatever it takes to get help. And that's the only way you can get help. Admit you need help. And then here's another one. Number two. Admit you need help. Humbly repent to God. Here's one that's going to make you a little bit upset. And others. What? It's just me and God. No. Nope. No, it's not. It's not just you and God. Uh, what does is, what is Jesus, what does the Apostle Paul say? What is the body of Christ called? What? What's the body of Christ called? It's the what of Christ. I gave you the answer. The body of Christ is the body of Christ. Okay. The head is Jesus. So you got to be involved with the body or you're not going to get better or you're not going to grow or you're not going to be helpful in the way you should be. You need to humbly repent to God and others. Why is it, oh, it's just between me and God. I have found when it's just between me and God, I keep doing the same thing over and over again because it's just between me and God. I find freedom when it's between me and God and I go to somebody else, say, hey, listen, I got an issue that requires tissues with this thing. I need help with this. Can you hold me accountable in this area? Can you ask me how I'm doing with this area? If I don't do that, then the darkness comes. I have a secret. A secret is blackmail. Blackmail, you start doing things you don't want to do. So you need to get someone else involved. 
Just, I will, listen to what he says here. Humbly repent to God and others. Verse 15, um, Luke 15, verse 18. It says the following. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. So he did the first part. God, I'm sorry. And I've sinned against you. Some of us maybe have to make some phone calls or have long talks and say, listen, I've wronged you. Would you please forgive me? I've asked God to forgive me. Or maybe you were involved with, it, with something in your, I, I know I'm bringing this up a lot because it's an issue. Maybe you've been unfaithful with your eyes in your marriage. Maybe you've been unfaithful with your feet in your marriage. Maybe you've done things and you had this thing in the back of your mind. If she ever knew, he ever knew, I'd be done for. And for the rest of your life, you are blackmailed and you have this heavy weight on you. Why not get it off there? Why not tell somebody? And I believe this, and I know this, I know this is controversial. Once again, just leave it to me to be controversial. I don't think husbands and wives should have secrets like that. For the rest of your life, you're going to be living with that guilt and shame. Now, granted, there are opportunities sometimes you're better off not saying it at first. But I believe in order to have a healthy marriage, you need to have an open, honest relationship with your spouse. And there's been people that I know, I know in all circumstances, but generally speaking, if you're involved with something like that, uh, get your spouse educated about it and then tell the spouse, listen, I did this and it's going to set you free. It's going to bring you closer to your spouse than you've ever dreamed possible. Listen, I, I actually know a pastor that was unfaithful to his wife in the early part of his ministry. And he was preaching and doing great things for God. But he always had this thing. I mean, he had this like, bondage in his life. He couldn't stop looking at women. couldn't stop lusting. So he'd be preaching. He'd find someone pretty in the audience. Like, wow. He's like, man, what's wrong with me? Then he realized he had a spirit of lust on him. And so he had, a, he had to ask God to forgive him of that. You know what he had to do? After he told his wife that he was unfaithful to her in the early part of his marriage. He thought he might lose his marriage. But as a result of that, he says, my marriage is now better than it ever has been. There's no more secrets. The devil loves secrets. He loves the dark. He hates the light. We gotta humbly repent to repent to God and others. You know what metanoia means? Repentance, I just told you. Repentance in the Greek word is metanoia. It's two words put together. Meto means change and transform. It's the same word you use for metamorphosis. Noia means turn, change your mind. So metanoia means God says, change your mind. And to change your mind is a lifelong process of changing the way you think about something. Repentance is not saying I'm just sorry. It's changing the way you think about yourself and God. When you realize you're loved by God and say, well, God's going to forgive me of this. And you realize that even though I screwed up, God loves me and forgives me and has a better day for me. And so now I look at God as a redeemer and I realize that I have great value to God. You have those two things together. You're on the pathway potentially for healing. But if you think you're a lower than, than scum and you think God's an angry taskmaster in heaven who's going to always keep you on the outside and never let you go on the inside, you're just, a, you're just a serf, you're just a servant, you're not a real child of a king, then you're going to be in bondage. But when you know the truth about who God is and how much he loves you and how he's died for you and how you're perfect in his sight because of the blood of Christ, then you can look at yourself in a different way and look at God in a different way. So humbly repent to God and others. How do you do that? Well, the Bible says this in Matthew 5. If you're, you're going to bring your gift to the altar, you go into church, and there uh, you remember you, your brother has something against you, leave your offering and go back and make it right with your brother. That's real worship. Come to church. Oh, Lord, I bless you. Oh, hallelujah. Meanwhile, on the way to church, you acted like the devil incarnate. Why not, re why not repent? Why not get it right? Here's something else. The Bible says in James 5.16. It says, confess your trespasses, your mistakes, your, your, your failings to God alone and pray for other people that they would not fall. Is that, that's what I thought it said, no? Look what it says here. Confess your trespasses to who? Who? One another. How's that happen? Through relationships. Freedom comes from relationships. Why do we make a big deal out of small groups? Is it because we went on the program for the church? No. Because you need to know people beyond just, hey, hey Jack, hey, Sally, how you doing? Good to see you. You need to be able to say and, and meet people, and wow, they got problems like I have. That's why I share with you. I'm honest with you sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I'm transparent with you. I'm like, uh, that is for true truth. I share with you. I try to be transparent so you'll open up. 
So listen, it, it, it's okay. You can come in and swim in here. It's called fellowship. It's called being real. And so you need to be able to have a relationship with somebody and say, hey, how you doing? When you're going through a situation, you can have someone pray for you. You can pray for them. That's not going to happen throughout relationship. We don't care what you do in, in small groups. Well, there's enough information out there. It's not about the information and curriculum. It's about relationship. And it's just an excuse to get together, to pray together, to read the word together, and to grow together. This is how we become free. We become free by being the body. And the body can't become the body unless the body likes each other and has friends. So you got to invest yourself in relationships. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So there is a correlation between confessing to God, confessing to another person. Otherwise, if you don't confess to somebody else, there's no accountability. Well, it's just me and God. It doesn't work too well. God didn't make it that way. Look what it says next. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We quote that all the time. That's directly connected to the same verse. The connotation of a powerful prayer is someone who confesses his sins to somebody else that's a believer. Now, be wise about it. Don't just throw your pearls before swine. But the way you get healed is to confess to God and confess to someone else. Don't live with secrets. You know, I, I, maybe some of you here, I don't know, there's someone watching, maybe you struggle with your, your sexual identity and you're ashamed. Listen, our church, we're going to be a church that loves everybody. If you struggle with your sexual identity, we're not going to say it's correct to engage in that activity, but we're going to tell you that God loves you, you have purpose, and there's a better way for you. We want to be a place where you can safe, safely land. Okay? This is an issue in our culture. If you've got trouble with drinking, you have trouble with, with sexual addictions, you've got trouble with gambling, you have trouble being prideful, you have trouble rooting for the Red Sox, we'll work with you. <laughs> you need to confess and bring your sin to the light. We ask the Lord forgive us when we keep in dark. We need to repent and we need to ask others for accountability and help us. And here's another one. Number three, daily choose to reject Satan's lies. You know, we're running low of time here, and so I'm just going to summarize. You know what happened? The, the prodigal son came back, right? And what happened? Well, the, son, the father was so excited, he came out to him. My son, which has been dead, he was dead because what he did was so shameful, he basically cut himself from the family. He came back. What did the father do? He came and he gave him a robe. He basically means, I'm, I'm putting a robe on you. I'm accepting you completely. I'm giving you my ring. And a ring is for power. You show your ring, it's like showing your credit card. Okay, you got it. Joseph had a ring in the book of Genesis. It gave him power. The, the Pharaoh gave him a ring. He gave him a ring, gave him sandals. He said, I want to be a slave. He says, no, you're not going to be a slave. You're going to be a son. Put on these sandals. Slaves don't wear sandals. And then he did something else. He did something really, really, really wild. He actually killed the fatted calf. No one has ever killed a fatted calf for me. And that's what happened. Look what happens in verse 29. Here's his son, the older son. You have the older son and the younger son. The older son goes like this. But he replied to him, after all these years, I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. Look at the attitude the older son has. I've slaved for you. Clean the dishes. Oh, dad. Clean your room. Oh, I'm a slave. My parents make me put my toys away. I slave for you and never once to refuse to do a single thing. Really? You mean to tell me you never made a mistake to your dad? That's correct. That's arrogance, my friends. That's bondage when you get bitter because you think that you're better than somebody else. Because the father's heart was to restore the family. The, little, the, 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 the older brother was thinking about himself. He's thinking about himself. All these years. And in all that time, you never even gave one young goat. Can you imagine not having a goat? My grandfather used to say, that really gets my goat. I never understood what that meant to have a goat. I guess I'm missing out on life. Maybe I need to go out and buy a goat, okay? But he says, you never gave a goat to me for a feast with my friends. So you want to have a good time? Get a goat and have a feast. Okay, verse 30. Yet when your son of yours, the son of yours, not my brother, your son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing a fatted calf. 
And his father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed with me and everything I have is yours. You know what happened, by the way? I told you earlier to pay attention. When he divided his inheritance, you know what the older son gets in the Jewish culture? Double the, double the portion. He said, you never gave me a goat. What are you kidding? He had a whole flock of them. He got two-thirds. The older son got two-thirds of his father's wealth. The younger son got one-third. But he was jealous because his younger brother was being accepted back. That's bondage too, my friends, when you think you're better than somebody else. Well, those people over those sinners, those folks. No, that's bondage as well. You have to choose to reject Satan's lies. Number four, choose to receive God's truth. But his father said to him, quick, bring the finest robe. And so you saw, I talked about that already, what happened. He had the robe of righteousness, right? The Bible talks about that. It talks about Isaiah uh, 61.10, put on the robes of righteousness. Genesis 4 talks about, 41 talks about the ring. He had authority. He had rulership. Joseph had a rulership. He had shoes of peace. The Bible says, behold, I give you authority to trample on the serpents and scorpions and all of the power of the enemy. My friends, we have power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. So we have that. Jesus said, behold, I'll give you authority. So listen, I, we have power over all these things. And so how do you get free? Number one, you need to admit you got an issue. Say, I have to admit it. Admit it, first of all. Then you need to share it with God and with the body of Christ. Now, just don't go around having your business. Find people that are reputable that are going to keep a confidence. Don't do this alone. I tell people all the time that work in the church or do things, that listen, if you have an issue in your marriage or family, come and tell me. I, I'm, I won't throw you out. If you're struggling with sin, I'm not going to throw you out and expose you. But if you lie to me and say things are fine and they're not, yeah, I will do then. I, you know, but you tell me, I want to create an environment where we're honest with each other and say, you know what, I'm really struggling with this. Okay, let's work it out together. I don't have the same struggle you have. But you know what? We're all sinners saved by grace, and we're all children of God now. We all need help. And so we need to admit to God and each other and pray for one another to be healed. And then we need to take the authority that's ours in Christ Jesus and maintain our freedom. I want to conclude our time here today. We also need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is another topic for another time. I encourage you. We'll talk about that in coming weeks. But I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way back up. First John... One, starting at verse five. This is basically summarizing what we just talked about for the last five minutes. This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God, First John 1 verse five. This is the message which we've heard from the beginning and we declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Do you have darkness in your life? God is light, and in him there's no darkness. If you have darkness in your life, you have an area that God is not surrendered to. You're not surrendered to God in a certain area? That's not of God. Look what the Bible says. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not Practice the truth. Do you have secrets that you do in the darkness? No one knows about. If they only knew the problem I have with this person, the relationship I have with this person, what I'm doing with this person, what I'm doing with this, this situation, what I'm doing when no one else is gone, the whole family's gone, I'm by myself, I'm away on business, I'm doing this, I'm doing the other, I'm by myself, this is what I'm doing. Does anyone know what's going on? The Bible says, in him there's no darkness, and we lie and do not practice the truth if we remain in darkness. Check this out. Verse 7. But if, an opportunity, we, don't you love, the Apostle Paul doesn't say, if you, he goes, if we. You see that? Apostle Paul was humble about it. If we walk in the light. You can only walk in the light if you have no dark areas. Flip on the lights. There should be no secrets in your life in regards to hidden sins. It gives the devil power. But if we walk in the light, as he 
is in the light. Okay, walk in the light as he's in the light. What happens after that? We have fellowship with God. What does it say? With who? I can't hear you. What? Too much loud rock and roll. What would you say? One another. We have a fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, Jesus, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What's the darkness in your life that's controlling you? It's time to get out of the darkness. It's time to step into the light. It's time to have fellowship with other believers. Today, when you walk out of here, there's a table out there. It's not the end all and get all. It's just a catalyst to help you and I to foster relationships with other believers where you and I can begin to know each other, pray for each other, grow together, and be an army. One can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. There's grace and power in unity. We need each other. Get out of the dark. Admit you have a problem. Admit it to God. Get healing. Let's walk this out together. Let's pray. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, that dark area can be eradicated. No longer living in fear of being caught or found out. Does he mean that? Yes, he does mean that. Some of you, you're, you're, right now, you hear something in your mind. Uh, I can't get, I, that's just too much to ask. No, it's not too much to ask. Listen, you are one decision away from freedom. Why live in darkness? I'm going to pray a prayer over you in a few moments. But before we do that, if you're not in Jesus Christ, none of this stuff works. Because you can't do it without Christ. And so I'm going to ask you this morning to give your life to Jesus Christ. Because you know why? You can't be good enough. You can't say enough good things. It's only what Christ has done on the cross. He paid for our sins. You can never pay for your sins. So receive the, the unbelievable gift of salvation that pays for every sin that you and I have ever done before. Let's pray. If you want to ask Christ in your heart today, maybe you've walked away. Today's a new day for you. You want to make a, make a new commitment or perhaps go to the Lord for the first time. Pray this prayer from your heart and believe it today. And today is a new day for you. Just pray silently in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much that you died on the cross to pay for all of my sins, both known and unknown. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins. I confess them to you. I thank you that you not only died on the cross, but you rose again from the dead. I believe you are the Son of God. I give you my life today and declare you are God and I am not. Give me the power and the ability to walk the path you have for me in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Just say a quick show of hands. Come on, it's good to admit. This morning, anyone else? Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer this morning. I, I give my life to Christ. Okay, I want to pray a prayer over you right now. A prayer for freedom. Okay? You want to close your eyes and listen. It, the power of prayer is important. I'm going to pray over you first. I'm going to have you pray. We pray for you right now. Father, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for the freedom that was bought for us on the cross of Jesus Christ. I declare over the Cornerstone Church, not because of who I am, but because of who you are and the position you've given me as a shepherd of this church, Lord, I speak over this church right now. I break off every spirit upon this church right now. I break the spirit of pride in Jesus' name. I command the spirit of pride to leave. I command the spirit of titles and positions and trying to outdo each other. 
We command that to go in Jesus' name. This church is about honoring Jesus Christ above all. And the greatest of the kingdom is a servant of all. So we break the power of pride. Lord, I pray the power of racism in Jesus' name, the demonic realm of racism, of elitism, of social economic elitism, that I am better because I make more money, or I'm better because I have a greater education, or I'm better because I'm of certain ethnicity. In Jesus' name, you foul and disgusting spirit, I command you by the matchless and powerful name of Jesus to leave this church pride. You must go in Jesus name and in Jesus name right now I pray for the lust of the eyes in Jesus name you must go materialism you must go in Jesus name and the lust of the flesh father I pray for the spirit of homosexuality to be broken in Jesus name for adultery to be broken in Jesus name for, uh, for pornography to be broken in Jesus' name. I, I come against the spirit of cheating in Jesus' name. And I speak the freedom and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ over this church in the lust of the flesh. We break it with the power of the Lord. Break addictions in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. I, I render them powerless because of Jesus. I tie them up, I bound them in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you, and I want you to pray a prayer. Let me just say something, if you look at me real quickly. We pray these things. In the name of Jesus, is powerful. I just said those things, they're powerful. But you gotta get the guest out of your house. We just bound that junk in your house. Now it's time to get the louse out of the house. You need to get that stuff, and you need to confess it. You need to get it out in the open. Push it out. It's bound in Jesus' name. But you're only going to be free if you tell God and you tell somebody else, do not live with secrets. Push it out in Jesus' name. I don't care what it is. Listen, let's be free, guys. Come on. Let's be free here this morning. I'm going to ask you to pray. I have this prayer written down here for you. I'm going to ask you to pray this with your heart out loud. You just repeat it after me. And if you mean what you pray, there's power in it. Listen, it's not about words. It's about the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. It is powerful. So if you want to bow your head and close, whatever you want to do, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I bow and worship and praise before you. I surrender myself completely and unreservedly in every area of, of my life. I take a stand against all the workings of Satan in my life. Lord, I resist all the endeavors of Satan and his wicked spirits to rob me of the well of you. I choose to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I pull down every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ and loose myself to a sound mind the mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Let's just thank the Lord. Let's all stand. Come on. We thank you, Lord. Listen. This only works if you're in the body. Get connected to other believers. Get connected to other believers. Get connected to other believers. Get connected to God. Listen, we're in a battle, folks. Let's win this war together. Come on, right? Come on, let's thank you, God.
Amen. Listen, what we want to do, we're going to ask the prayer team to make their way down. If you need prayer for your body, you need prayer for your situation, you need a job, whatever it is, we want to pray with you this morning. We're family here. We're just going to bless you and we're going to honor you. If you need prayer for anything at all, we ask you to come forward as the band plays quietly. Otherwise, we dismiss you to have coffee or come to 401, 301. God bless you.